Up next, a married man falls victim to temptation. He had made a mistake, which I am sure a lot of people can identify with. She offered him a wild side that he hadn't experienced. Then he vanishes without a trace. He was there one minute and then gone the next. For almost 20 years, the disappearance goes unsolved. I kept that hope that maybe he would show up on my doorstep. Until a tiny chip of paint tells of a terrifying ordeal. It would drive me crazy to know what a murder victim goes through every time they're killed. The Kennecott Copper Mine outside Salt Lake City, Utah, is known as the richest hole on Earth. And copper isn't the only valuable mineral. They mine gold and silver, and they have very expensive equipment, that sort of thing. That uh, Theft is a big problem out there. As a result, security is very tight. You just don't go onto Kennecott Copper property without usually encountering security. So when the security guard wasn't on duty in the guard shack on a winter night in 1991, it was unusual. They went up and figured that he might be in the restroom, checked it out for a while. They went up and found his lunch was partly eaten. His hard hat was still there. The guard, Brian Roof, was not supposed to leave the shack for any reason until the shift changed at 11 o'clock. It was just a strange incident where he was there one minute and then gone the next, and, and there was no real exp explanation of why he was gone. Snow had fallen just a few hours earlier, but there were no footprints around the shack. Brian's car was parked in a nearby lot, and there were no footprints anywhere near his car. It looked like he might have just stepped outside the door and, and vanished, but it was in a very isolated area. Inside the shack, everything was in order. No sign of uh, any foul play at all, no blood, nothing turned over or, or destroyed. 21-year-old Brian Roof and his wife Jennifer had been married for two and a half years and had a 15-month-old baby. Work records showed this wasn't the first time Brian went missing. Just a few weeks earlier, Brian walked off his job and ran away to Las Vegas. He felt a big burden to provide for us, especially with a second baby coming. He felt that burden, and he was trying to get through school. And I know that finances worried him a lot. He felt bad that we had to move in with my parents at the time. Brian spent six days in Las Vegas. When he returned, he was a changed man, and not for the better. He was very cold and distant, a side of him I'd never seen before. He was um, very cold, bitter about certain things, finances, things like that, and just, um, just angry. As investigators searched the guard shack for clues, the phone rang. The caller said she was Brian's wife, Jennifer. She was surprised when somebody else answered the phone when Brian didn't answer. They told her at that time that they were the police and they were looking for Brian. She did tell them that she'd been talking to him around 6.30. He had told her that uh, there's a, another employee coming is how he termed it, and he just had to go. As soon as police got off the phone with Jennifer, the phone rang again. The deputy again answered the phone call, knew it was a different female voice, and the caller told the deputy that her name was Jennifer Roof. Somebody was claiming that they were Brian's wife that really wasn't. A missing man with two wives. Police knew right away it was going to be an unusual investigation. Shortly after Brian Roof's disappearance from his security job, two women called his work phone asking to speak to him. Each of them identified herself as his wife. The company's caller ID system revealed one of the callers was indeed Brian's wife, Jennifer. The other was 20-year-old Christy Bradley. She was married to Dale Bradley, who was also a security guard at the Kennecott Mine and one of Brian Roof's co-workers. So that's when they sent detectives over to Dale and Christy's house to find out what was going on. 
Christie told police that she and Brian had become good friends and talked regularly on the phone. Dale would have Christie bring dinner out to him. And that's how Brian and Christy met, is actually out at the job site when she would bring meals out to him. When questioned about Brian's disappearance, Christy said she was home all day and hadn't seen him. Dale said he had been off from work and was running errands all day. Dale Bradley said he was up at the University of Utah. When his car broke down, he called his friend, Bill Easton, who was down at a local bar here. Five days after Brian disappeared, his wife Jennifer discovered a potential clue. There were credit card bills that I had never seen before. We had not applied for them together, and also a phone bill. Jennifer discovered that Brian was having an affair with Christy Bradley. It was a double whammy to have him missing and then to be hit with such horrifying news that everything had been shattered my whole life, had been shattered, everything that I had dreamed and hoped for was gone. Jennifer also discovered that Christy was with Brian in Las Vegas a few weeks earlier. When confronted with this information, Christy admitted the affair to both the police and her husband. She told me that she thought Brian was really nice. She thought he was cute. Dale was very controlling to her, and Christy didn't like to be tied down. Christy and, and Brian were able to talk to each other, and that's, I think, the reason for the phone calls to the guard shack between Christy and Brian. But Dale insisted he knew nothing about his wife's affair when Brian disappeared. Dale had no criminal history, but the affair gave him a motive to harm Brian, so investigators got a search warrant for his car. It was checked for blood and gunshot residue. None of which we found. We didn't find anything. In addition, Dale and Christy Bradley agreed to take polygraph tests, and they both passed. When they found out about the affair, I had heard they interviewed Dale and Christy, and um, Dale passed a polygraph. And at that point, they kind of dropped his name from, from the list of suspects. Meanwhile, investigators pursued another potential lead. Two of Ryan's fellow security guards had been arrested for stealing from the mine. They were arrested for stealing metals off of Kennecott property and pawning them in uh, uh, junk metal shops, or, you know, for junk metal. In fact, one of those guards was at the guard shack just minutes after Brian was reported missing. Brian was one of those at the guard shack who reported some of these thefts going on. But without Brian Roof's body, police had no proof he was dead. Officially, he was still a missing person. Shortly after Brian Roof disappeared, police uncovered a theft ring run by security guards at the Kennecott mine. They were stealing anything that wasn't nailed down. They were stealing gloves, shovels, you know, just any kind of equipment that you would find around a mine. Police wondered if Brian might have stumbled on a robbery in progress. So a theory came up that maybe these guys were stealing metals off of the property that night, and Brian had stopped them, and they'd killed him to cover up the, the theft. But none of the other security guards could be linked to Brian's disappearance. He basically was completely alone up there in the mountain, and it really concerned him that it was an unsafe area, that there were no cameras, no electric gates, no security systems like they had in the other gates. Weeks and then months passed with absolutely no sign of Brian Roof. It was an overwhelming fear. When I would be driving to work or driving to the store, it was just a constant cloud over me of fear that somebody could just disappear and never come back. Brian's wife, Jennifer, was forced to raise their little girl alone. Six months after Brian went missing, she gave birth to another daughter. I just couldn't move on. I was stuck in that realm of of grief until I knew what had happened to him. One year later, hikers 
discovered human remains in a camping area about 50 miles from the Kennecott mine. Well, at first I just thought it was rock, and then I thought maybe it was a dead guy. He still had his security outfit on, as you say, his wallet, everything intact. That's him, Brian Patrick Ruck. So I got a phone call from the detectives, and I asked him, I said, is it Brian? And he said, yeah, it's Brian. And that's when my world fell apart. Dental records confirmed the victim was Brian Roof. An autopsy showed he'd been shot five times in the back. I thought that somehow he had gotten in the middle of something illegal, and they killed him for that. Search teams found five spent shells from a 22 caliber pistol near the body. Investigators believe Brian was shot just a few feet from where he was buried in a shallow grave. The next day, they're out there working again, and one of the uh, dogs from the canine unit recovers a boot, a black cowboy boot that was identified as Brian's work boot that was recovered about 200 feet east of the gravesite. Uh, never did find a second boot. But so much time had passed and so much rain and snow had fallen that no other clues were found at the scene. It's really frustrating. There's no other way to put it. With no evidence to tie anyone to the crime, the case went cold and the years passed. Until 14 years later, when Todd Park, a cold case detective with the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office, received a telephone call from authorities in neighboring Carbon County. When that call came in, it gave me, a, I guess, a fresh breath of air to look at another case and to, to really dig into it. Police in Carbon County were investigating Dale Bradley on the suspicion of murdering his second wife, Crystal. Dale had been a suspect in Brian Roof's murder 14 years earlier. On a hunch, Todd Park contacted Dale's first wife, Christy, who was now living in Texas. So when Detective Park contacted her 14 years after the fact, she was surprised that the case hadn't been solved because Dale told her somebody else had already been arrested for it, and she just assumed this case was done. But that obviously was a lie. And Christy told police something she hadn't mentioned during the original investigation. She said the day after Brian went missing, Dale cleaned the inside of his car. He had never cleaned out that trunk as long as she had known him, as long as uh, he'd owned that Camaro. Why would Dale do this? Police wondered if Brian Roof had been inside that trunk. Was there blood? Was he shot in the car and wrapped in a blanket and looking for, uh, you know, trace evidence, looking for blood in the car? But after 14 years, could police find Dale Bradley's Camaro? 14 years after Brian Roof's murder, and investigators never lost hope they would solve the case. The thing about Brian, he was a very good kid, and he was a very good father. And regardless of the affair, I think he was a very good husband. He just had a lot going on, and I think he would have been able to really make something of his life and his family if he was able to continue on in life. And that was cut short. When investigators heard that their original suspect, Dale Bradley, was now a suspect in yet another murder investigation, they decided to look once again at the evidence. And this time, on Brian Roof's boot, the one they found in the mountains near his burial site, they spotted something, some kind of scuff mark on the bottom of the boot that looked like reddish-orange paint. When I saw that swatch of paint, it just flashed back to me that that was the same color of paint that was on Dale Bradley's car. And I, I got excited, and I kind of got a little bit of butterflies, and I thought, I got him. Forensic analyst Bill Schneck examined this paint with a stereo microscope. 
and I noticed it was a smear. It wasn't like paint chips that were adhering to the boot. It's actually smeared into the leather at the bottom of the boot. There was tremendous force to get that paint smear onto his boot. Was it the kind of force caused by trying to kick your way out of the trunk of a car, for example? Bill Schneck needed to know if the makers of Dale Bradley's Camaro had painted the inside of the trunk. Luckily, Schneck had a friend who restored old cars. And he just happened to have a 75 Camaro when I was there. So we popped the trunk, and indeed, they have original paint in the trunk. So that was good. That was useful. Dale Bradley drove a red 1974 Camaro at the time of Brian's murder. The mission now was to find it. I spent a lot of hours searching for that car. They went up in an airplane and searched high and low for that car. Through a lot of investigation, found that the car had been sold. Unfortunately, two years after Brian's murder, the new owner sold the car for scrap metal. That car was scrapped. I mean, it's just in little cubes. It's been melted down. But an examination of the case file revealed a surprise. 14 years earlier, an alert detective had taken paint samples from Dale's car. We just took them. <laughs> it's hard to say why, you know, just, we just took them and, because uh, there wasn't really much else to, to take. Those paint samples just sat in our evidence room for years. Bill Schneck took paint samples from the boot and the car and placed them on slides with an immersion liquid. This eliminated any air trapped between the sample and the slide. Using a polarizing light microscope magnified up to a thousand times, Schneck saw the paint was a lead chromate paint. I wanted to go back and find out how unusual is a lead chromate paint. And I contacted the National Institute of Science and Technology and received a paint chip known standard from the 74 Camaro. Using a scanning electron microscope, Schneck now did a three-way comparison. He examined paint from the boot, from the car, and from the file sample of a 1974 Camaro. All were identical. Paint on the boot came from that particular car or another car having those exact same uh, properties, composition. And with this evidence, Dale Bradley was arrested and charged with Brian Roof's murder. It was shocking that anybody could do something so horrific, let alone somebody that claimed to be a good friend. Prosecutors believe Dale either knew or strongly suspected Brian Roof was having an affair with his wife, Christy, and was afraid she was going to leave him. I think that he was so angry that Christy and Brian betrayed him that he was going to make them pay. The forensic evidence suggests Dale's plan was to eliminate the person he perceived to be his competition. Since he knew Brian's hours and when there would be the least amount of traffic, he knew exactly when to strike. Dale probably forced Brian into the trunk at gunpoint. Brian tried to kick his way out of the trunk during the 30-minute drive when a piece of the paint became embedded in his boot. When Dale got to the burial spot, prosecutors think he ordered Brian to remove his boots so he couldn't run away. What? Take your boots off now. Right. Fine. Whatever you say. He then forced him over to a shallow grave, which prosecutors think he dug earlier that day. Then shot him with a 22 caliber pistol. The murder weapon was never recovered. 
it was so typical of Dale's personality to be a coward enough to shoot somebody in the back and not face him when he was going to take his life. The paint and circumstantial evidence were difficult for Dale Bradley to refute. He agreed to plead guilty to second degree manslaughter and kidnapping and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. What Bradley didn't realize was that Brian's boot held an important piece of evidence that told a story. This cold case was solved because of that paint chip. It makes me want to go out and look at every single case and examine every piece of evidence to see if there's something that I can do with it. It motivates me to solve other cases. Dale Bradley remains a suspect in the murder of his second wife. It's ironic in a way that Brian Roof's desperate efforts in the trunk of Dale's car resulted in the capture of his own killer. Just one little thing, that's all it takes. In this case, it turned out to be the paint samples, coupled with all the, the, the uh, circumstantial evidence in this case and, and the physical evidence that you have, uh, that was just the clincher in this case. Well, even today, though, there's a lot of detectives that are just focusing so much on DNA, they're forgetting all the other avenues that could be approached with trace evidence, such as pain examination. I hope it sends a loud message that there is forensics out there, that people who are willing to uh, continue to look at these cases, that you're not going to get away with murder, and that, um, that the more they try to cover up some of their tracks, the more tracks they leave.